uh, officer. And uh, uh, the topic that we would like to explore with you today is on regeneration. And I thought uh, probably the easiest way to uh, develop this would be just simply to uh, provide a narrative as to how this emerged uh, for us uh, at Ubiquity University and Humanity Rising. And uh, then uh, Leslie, who's actually the director of our Masters in Regenerative Action, uh, can describe the program. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, all of you are, are interest, uh, who are interested are welcome to join uh, as we move forward. Um, and um, uh, we'll be done I think with the session in about an hour. Uh, so um, I will launch, uh, Rick says, I'm the president of Ubiquity University. And uh, Ubiquity University is really on a mission to reinvent education as we know it with the specific intention of preparing uh, students of all ages, learners of all ages uh, with the skills they need uh, to successfully navigate an increasingly hyper-complex, uh, unpredictable and turbulent world uh, that we see all around us. Uh, and in that context, to be able to come together collaboratively to solve global challenges. So that's what has motivated uh, the staff and uh, myself as the founder uh, of Ubiquity uh, for many, many years. Uh, it's clear that the human race and the larger planetary ecology is on the brink of, um, I would say, systemic dysfunction. Uh, in the last uh, 50 years, uh, human activity uh, has decimated 69% uh, of all the biodiversity on planet Earth. And if you just take in that single fact, uh, we, uh, we have a problem, Houston. And that's what we're all seeking to deal with uh, in one way or another. And we all know that to be true. And at the center of the erosion of biodiversity is now runaway climate change. Because as we've destroyed the biodiversity, we've also been escalating the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere. Now, uh, I think at 409 parts per million, uh, a situation that we haven't had uh, in the last 70 years on this planet. And our governments are essentially all asleep, every single one of them. Uh, there's not a leader anywhere in the world that is actually doing what is scientifically necessary uh, to stop the coming cataclysm. Uh, and scientists are now telling us that we have um, less than 10 years uh, to turn things around. So this decade of the 2020s um, uh, will probably turn out to be the most consequential 10 years uh, in the history of the human species. Um, uh, they say that the greatest crisis in our our history happened hundreds of thousands of years ago when due to climactic changes and so forth, we were reduced to 70,000 mating pairs. And somehow we squeezed through the eye of that needle and now there's 7.6 billion of us. And once again, we're on the precipice and could be reduced once more uh, uh, to uh, just a few mating pairs. Um, uh, no less than James Lovelock, uh, who was the uh, scientist, uh, the British scientist that really developed the Gaia hypothesis or originally, uh, and then what is now the Gaia theory that the earth is a living organism. Uh, he's predicted that by 2100, uh, that 90% of the entire human race will be wiped out uh, by a combination of epidem uh, epidemics of infectious diseases, war, and migration. And you can see all around us, 
we're in a pandemic. Uh, and uh, there are more water refugees than uh, war refugees. And migration uh, is uh, erupting all over the war, all over the world as habitats are destroyed by our own actions. When you consider that this is happening not to us, but by us, you get a measure of why it is that uh, someone like uh, me, and I imagine most of you, certainly Leslie and Rick, spend most of their time in trying to figure out how do you change human consciousness? Because it's the dysfunction in our consciousness that's causing the entirety of the problem that besets us. This isn't happening because of some alien invasion. No one is forcing us to act with such cruelty to each other and to the ecosystem. We're doing it to ourselves voluntarily. And that should give us real pause um, uh, about uh, who we are uh, due to what we're doing. Uh, so Ubiquity University has been founded uh, to uh, deal with this challenge and to create a learning system that uh, is uh, motivated, uh, purposed to provide, uh, especially young people growing up because they're ground zero. They're gonna take the hit of everything that we're leaving undone. And uh, so uh, I wanna uh, just underscore as we begin our program today, in my view, the absolute gravity of our situation and therefore the absolute imperative that we analyze reality as ruthlessly as we can because if we do not, we're highly likely to destroy ourselves. Uh, and it's worth um, noting uh, something that David Suzuki, the Canadian uh, evolutionary uh, biologist has observed that in the history of life on Earth, 95% of all the species that have arisen are now extinct. So extinction, far more than survival, uh, is the norm in the evolutionary process of things. Why? Because 95% of the species haven't been able to continually adapt themselves as life changes occurred to ensure that the life of their species would endure. And right now, as most of you know, we're actually in the sixth mass extinction uh, uh, for our planet. And it has not been induced by climate changes as much as human activity. So that is compounding um, our uh, global challenge in our global crisis. The only way that we can extricate ourselves out of this predicament is by adapting um, regeneration as our watchword. Uh, and I would like to tell you the story of how regeneration uh, came to pass uh, at uh, Ubiquity. Uh, and that is that uh, during the, the depths of the pandemic, when it was really hitting us last March and April, uh, knowing that every crisis represents an opportunity, uh, we uh, decided to create a global commons, uh, a free space like we're enjoying today on uh, Unity Week. Uh, so that uh, people uh, from all over the world could just come together and share their experiences about what it's like uh, going through the pandemic. Uh, we're in an unprecedented human situation and the governments of the world are uh, responding to it uh, in unprecedented ways uh, and highly authoritarian ways. We were all forced into lockdown democratic norms and procedures were violated. Uh, we were compelled to uh, stay essentially in isolation, engage in social distancing, 
uh, and to wear masks. Uh, and never before in all of human history have governments so quickly, so effectively exercised authoritarian control so broadly. And when you think about that, in relation to what I said in my opening, that we're not doing this because it's being done to us, we're doing it to ourselves. That after 50 years of an intentional decimation of our biosystem, we're now beginning to cannibalize ourselves. That's a hard truth to grapple with, especially at a time when we want to celebrate unity and all the good things about humanity. Uh, but I would submit that there's a direct relationship between the way we have been destroying our biodiversity and the way that we've reacted to the COVID pandemic. It's the same wanton disregard for life. So when we began to put humanity rising together, uh, we were unsure what the response would be. And uh, we were delighted that it turned out to be uh, highly uh, attractive. And next thing we knew, we essentially had a, a tsunami on our hands and thousands and thousands of people uh, joined uh, the Zoom calls every day. Um, Rick Buckley, who uh, introduced me just a few minutes ago, uh, was our tech uh, uh, coordinator. And so he and I, uh, for 275 days as of today, have been cheek by jowl um, uh, in the last uh, six months with Leslie uh, convening these programs uh, on every conceivable issue um, all around uh, trying at this critical and highly complex, and I would say systemically dysfunctional moment in the human journey, when we seem to be intent on destroying ourselves and the ecosystem. We seem to be intent on doing that. How do we, in that situation, turn things around? What do you do on the Titanic after it's hit the iceberg? That's the situation in which we found ourselves. So I had a conversation with the president of, of uh, the University of International Cooperation uh, in Costa Rica, a guy by the name of Ed Muller, who founded the institution uh, back in 1996. Uh, the same year as it turned out uh, when the school was founded that became Ubiquity University. Uh, so Ed and I have been uh, working in the educational domain uh, for exactly the same length of time. And uh, he said something to me that kind of uh, stopped my world for a moment because uh, I'd been working on sustainability issues and environmental issues uh, for many, many decades. And he said, uh, Jim, it's no longer possible to be sustainable. You can't be sustainable with a broken ecology when 69% of the entire biodiversity of this planet has been destroyed. The only option left for humanity is regeneration. We have to proactively, strategically, and on a war footing, regenerate both humanity, but also the ecology simultaneously. And that, you know, hit me between the eyes like a, a diamond bullet, as they say. And um, so I invited Ed to convene 
initially uh, a seven day program uh, in July of last year. And then in October, a five day program all around this issue of how do we in this critical moment with only a few years left uh, to uh, do anything meaningful, meaningful meaning, not something that makes you feel good, but something that actually makes a measurable physical difference in the world. How do we bring regenerativity into the world in a passionate but effective way? And Ed had really been carrying this for a number of years. He had been uh, involved in uh, a project called Regenerate Costa Rica. Uh, he'd been working through the United Nations and their commission on biodiversity uh, for many, many years. Uh, uh, biodiversity and regenerativity um, was, um, was uh, something that he tried to do at uh, the University of International Cooperation. But the accreditors uh, in Costa Rica wouldn't let him start a program on regeneration. Why? Because the field of regeneration didn't exist, they said. So how can you develop a department at a university when the field doesn't exist? And Ed could not persuade them to the contrary. And so a uh, ubiquity uh, also accredited, but accredited in a different way. We're accredited uh, through the Global Accreditation Council uh, based in The Hague that mandates that uh, institutions in order to be accredited uh, by the Global Accreditation Council actually make a commitment to ecological sensitivity and regenerative action uh, in the world. So we developed a partnership and uh, Ed uh, and UCI, we're going to, uh, uh, in our initial thinking, uh, we're going to organize the uh, biodiversity regions, the bio regions in Costa Rica and around the world. Uh, Ubiquity would put together a master's program, a, a reinvention of the MBA, uh, but not a static master's in business administration, you know, as if business was operating as usual but a master's in regenerative action in the world. And we contemplated this, we discussed it in the various uh, Humanity Rising sessions, uh, and we began to realize that this was a major attractor. And so we decided, well, why don't we build a coalition, uh, a, a, a self-conscious coalition that would um, uh, both build uh, the uh, MRA out, uh, but also to think through how do we instigate a globally scalable meme such that within a short period of time, a matter of years, regeneration would replace sustainability in planetary dialogue about the future of humanity. How do you do that? It has to be done or we're not gonna make it through the eye of the needle, but we're small universities because the mainstream ed educational institutions like the mainstream businesses supported by the mainstream governments are all sleepwalking virtually without exception. There are a few companies that have woken up, but they're predominantly very small. There are hundreds of organizations um, uh, like those represented on this call, like Ubiquity, like uh, World Unity Week that are passionate about it, but we don't even come to amount to a pimple on the buffalo's back. So the challenge that I, I've been wrestling with and the challenge that I would put to all of you today um, is how, 
how do we reach critical mass? How do we reach critical mass at this fragile moment of decision and consequence for our species on this planet? Uh, because in the end, uh, the planet does not need us. We need the planet. And uh, if we went extinct, you would probably hear a cheer from the rest of nature. And Mother Earth would just continue going. Probably with a momentary note of sadness, uh, but that would be just about it. So uh, we have um, uh, uh, this deep complexio within which uh, an issue like regeneration uh, needs to um, uh, take shape. Uh, and uh, I think what I'll uh, do at this point is rather than uh, uh, expound further uh, on the program and, and what we're doing, there's a lot that can be said, but I'd like to, to share the platform form with uh, Leslie Southwick Trask. And by way of introducing her, um, uh, she's um, one of the most phenomenal people I've had the pleasure to meet uh, since uh, Humanity Rising began. And um, we've had over a thousand speakers. Uh, we have upwards of 350 to 400 organizations. We have tens of thousands of people that have come through. And Leslie just kind of meandered in. And uh, within a short period of time, she was being very active in our uh, Humanity Rising sessions, uh, began to organize the, uh, uh, with others, uh, you know, our, our uh, after session chat group, uh, then developed uh, with others uh, a peace lab and began to convene some sessions. Uh, and she caught, uh, my attention and uh, uh, the next thing, to make a long story very, very short, uh, she was brought in uh, to uh, uh, manage our Masters in Regenerative Action, which is really at the center of what Ubiquity seeks to bring into the world. Uh, and, um, and then we've recently invited her to actually come in as our Chief uh, Development Officer and help us build out uh, the entire university, at the center of which is a institutional, and I would say individual commitment to be part of those groups and that ethos around spawning and scaling globally um, the uh, imperative for regeneration in our time. So Leslie, I really want to thank you for being uh, regeneration first responder, uh, and uh, welcome you to join me and and describe uh, 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 our MRA. Well, you know, Jim, thank you for that introduction. Um, it, it is a puzzle to me sometimes because I think, in many ways, when I've finished listening as I, I did this morning to Humanity Rising and to Bob Kennedy and all what's going on in terms of, of this world of major information conflict. Like, who do you listen to? How do you listen to them? We've kind of been sleepwalking for decades. And I, I think that, you know, we, we're lulled into, you know, certain information sources. We sort of pick those up. They kind of feed, feed our, our energy for that moment. And we, we just stay, stay stuck in those energy sources, that information source, that truth that we think is that which we need to know. And it's only when you start to force yourself to look at alternative ideas, alternative ways of seeing the world, inconvenient ideas. You know, ideas that don't quite hit you and say, oh, that sounds easy. <laughs> it sounds bloody difficult. You know, it's only when we put ourselves in those situations do we start to unlearn that which we've learned. And for many of us, and I, and I say that, that, you know, excluding Generation Z, who are coming in fresh and newly encoded, 
and are the star children of our, our time, all the rest of us have been enculturated in a world in which the black and white, red and blue, all of those colors mean something specific. And now we're saying, you know what? Those don't mean the same thing as you once thought they did. You know, if you start thinking like mother nature, well, how do I think like mother nature? I'm a human, I'm a species called human. How do I do that? Does that mean I have to think differently about everything that I've used to make me, me? And the answer is, mm-hmm, yeah. And that's an inconvenient truth, Jim. And it's a hard one. So, you know, one of the things that I find that, that our, our uh, civilization, our society loves to do is quote rhetoric, you know? So yes, Einstein said, you can't solve a problem using the same type of thinking that got you into the problem. And Buckminster Fuller says to us, don't try to change or fix the system, create a new one. And so we you know these come off our lips really fast, right, Jimmy? We just go bloop, bloop. But what does it really mean? What does it really mean? Because my subconscious that is really well tuned was programmed in an era where none of this was happening. And so it really doesn't know how to process through what does regeneration mean? What does it mean to think like nature? What does it mean to have pattern thinking? What does it mean to be systems oriented? You know, we, we still are processing it through an old archetype of thought processes and belief systems that are keeping us in our current reality. So when I think about the MRA, I think about it unfreezing us, unlearning what we have thought to be truth. And that doesn't mean that what we used to know isn't true. That's not what this means. It means it was true for the time it existed. It is not necessarily true for today. So we get stuck on measuring our wealth by GDP. We're hearing all kinds of economists talking about this massive amount of money that people have now hoarded over the, over the pandemic because they couldn't spend it. And they've got these whopping big bank accounts that are ready to spend and the, and the luxury boat and car market has never been so hot. And those of us who sit inside the regeneration envelope go, why are you thinking of a boat and a car? Like, why is that even in your lexicon of desire? And, that, and yet that's reality for so many people. That is reality stuck in a caste class system that where wealth is what you have in your bank account, where um, being environmentally friendly is recycling, uh, where, you know, where I will save for my grandchildren, that's me paying forward to the next generation, when all of those are true, but they're not what we mean by regenerative action. It means that we have to unlearn what we once thought was real unlearn the way we think we we inhabit this planet and that's it's uncomfortable because when we're saying well then what do i need to relearn is that easy and the answer is it's all there once you've unlearned what you need to unlearn we have the solutions we have the answers we have the science we have the economic models donut economics We've got John Fullerton and his marvelous way of, of upending capitalism in a way that's doable. We have people who have been doing this thinking on our behalf for a long time. And they've been knocking at the door saying, listen, listen, and the time is now. We are ready. We don't have a choice. We have to listen. So when I think about the regenerative action master, I think about a global movement of change makers. And I think of them in the sense of those who of us that are waking up, realizing that the coffee is not the same coffee that it used to be, waking up that our bodies are not the same bodies that could travel in the earth a hundred years ago because of 
the pollutions, the pollutants that we have, of the toxins that we take in, that we are a new species about to be born. And that we have everything, and that's what World Unity Week stands for, is rebirthing or birthing again a new civilization. And we're here in the birth process. So I think sometimes when you know you wake up after sleepwalking and you start to look around and you say, where do you begin? Well, you begin in community. And I think you've got to find your soulmates, those people who are going to travel with you in the uncomfortable questions. So when you say, I have no clue what this means, you can say it out loud. And they say, guess what? Neither do we, but we're hungry to find out. And you hold their hands and you walk into the unknown, knowing that you're being taken on a journey that you will be protected by because you're working with other intelligences now. You're working with the heart intelligence, which will take you into spaces that your head doesn't know, but will keep you safe. So we're, we're triggering on these other intelligences. We, we're walking with friends who are with us on this journey. And we're moving into something that as we move, we ourselves are changing. We ourselves are becoming awake to how we can take a different kind of action. So the MRA is, is a global movement. And the thing I love, Jim, it's a pain in the butt because they're all around the world, is setting up a call with all our partners is a nightmare because we've got 24 time zones. <laughs> we're, we're balancing to keep all of our partners in play, but that's what global means. It means we're in different time zones, in different countries, in different cities, in different bioregions. And as we connect with one another, we, we realize just how much we have in common, where we realize that we are hungry and thirsty for being part of something significant. And so the, our global partners are unbelievable. I mean, when I think of um, uh, Vandana Shiva and Earth Democracy, you know, I mean, why are we not talking about democracy as in the US or Canadian democracy when we have the Earth Democracy that is powerful, ancient, and really instructive in terms of how we power balance? How do we live in harmony with diversity? We have living, breathing examples. And so we have this wisdom of indigenous life. We have shamanic wisdom that's coming into our MRA of the ancients, of, of the um, Peruvian shamans that have, are instructed by blueprints of this now time of evolution and human change. We are, we are fed by scientists like Ed, who are, is a master of regenerative science and biodiversity. We have people like Marilyn Hamilton and Beth Saunders who bring to us the cities as living organisms. They're not structures of buildings and streets and garbage removal. They are vibrant organisms that are operating right around us. And how do we engage in them and with them in a different way? No, it's not just about putting public spaces up. It's about really rethinking what is the function of a city in a regenerative world. And when I think about all of this, it's hard not to be blown away and excited about all the touchstone points. But what makes it really, really, I think, exciting are the impact projects. Because if I'm going to be studying all of these things that are now making me part of this new human race, I wanna be able to do something with it. I wanna be able to have an impact. And that's what the impact projects are. So the, an, an original master degree would be a dissertation with the MRA, it's an impact project. And we're bringing people together in pods of, of five to six people who are gonna be moving through the master together and together they are going to identify an impact project. That impact project may be down the street. It may be in a bioregion somewhere in South America. It may be anywhere in the world. We know where these projects can happen and we will help all of our students find the project that fits them and their own personal desire 
for impact. And then they get to learn all of these sciences, all of these different pathways in order to come into an impact that they can say, I am part of the regenerative agenda. I know how it, what it means when I say regenerative action. And the last thing I just wanna say is that one of the questions we get a lot, Jim, is, well, what career does this set me up for? You know, there's gotta be a career to this. If I take a master's of regenerative action, what career should I be going into? And the, and the answer is anyone you want because regenerative action isn't limited to a science degree or a profession. It's not limited to an IT career. It's not limited to a management or manufacturing um, job. It's all of the above. Because what we're not, we're not talking about is a siloed set of skills and practices that then take you into a focused one type all fits all career. We're saying that in the next decade, regenerative thinking, systems thinking, pattern frameworks, strategic intervention, uh, diverse facilitation. These are all going to be absolute requirements for any career, for any type of work life that you are going to have an impact with. So this isn't a MBA that says, I'm going to now have a master's in business and I'll go into business. This is a master's of regeneration, which means you're gonna be ready for any career in any field with a high set sensitivity and intelligence um, way of thinking and an emotional capacity to act that none of these other degrees can give you. Beautiful. That's what I think. <laughs> thank you, Leslie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, uh, uh, we've talked uh, long enough here, everyone. Um, so I suggest uh, for uh, the few minutes we've got left, if uh, any of you have any questions or comments, uh, there's a very small group. Uh, so we've got, looks like we got John West, Renew Talwar, uh, Tom Green, Shiv Talwar. Um, um, any uh, comments that uh, anybody would like to make? Hi, Shiv. Hi, Leslie, how are you? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, <clears throat> Kirk, um, uh, you remember Kirk? Uh, yes. Um, he teaches, uh, or he used to teach uh, a practice. And that practice is good for raising human consciousness. It is a practice which is science supported, supported by a neurophysiology, and it works whosoever does that. Um, the regenerative learning or any learning to be successful, uh, especially that kind of learning which is involved in resolving human problems of global scale, whether it's the environment, whether it is the human cruelty against other human beings, or whether it is um, physical health or mental health or executive function disorders that we have a big uh, um, pandemic of worldwide. Um, there are all kinds of problems to be fixed. And we need to raise human consciousness to do that. Mm -hmm. And there is a very simple practice which the whole humanity is somehow missing. It was a practice which was very common in the East. It was common in Sufism. It was common in European monasticism, all the monastics did breathe deeply. Um, we have a culture which is more or less encourages instinctive life, live a natural life, a life of natural instincts, 
And a life of natural instincts become a barrier in resolving any problem of global good or common good for that matter, even if that commonality extends over um, a single family. So when it comes to selfishness, instincts, instinctive life is great. And that can very easily be overcome with the practice that Kirk used to teach. I only attended one of his uh, presentations where he did that. And that practice is called conscious breathing. Mm -hmm. And the Buddha researched all of his life for a solution to human suffering. And what is human suffering? Human suffering is that of disease, whether it's physical or mental. Human suffering is because of helplessness, because they cannot get whatever they want. That kind of human suffering can be, he found, relieved or prevented with conscious breathing. Mm -hmm. And it is such a simple thing. It is so easily taken for granted. It doesn't cost any money. It takes very little time to teach. And people can raise their consciousness to connect with the need to regenerate, to connect with the need to stop their own suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this pandemic because we are so carelessly uh, eating gluttony, uh, gluttonously, uh, and uh, that lack of sensitivity can be. It is. It, it is scientifically. Uh, Removable, mm -hmm. simple with, simply with keeping people away from whatever they are addicted to. Mm -hmm. I used to take uh, give courses or workshops at the local hospital for ten years. We did that. Um, I had a team of six volunteers. I was one of the six, and we used to go to the local hospital in Kitchener, Ontario, mm -hmm. I live in Canada, uh, and they have a, a department of addiction management. Mm -hmm. And we used to go there and teach this, uh, give workshops and deep breathing as a tool to help people get out of their own addictions. Mm. And, and we help a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. And the clients were telling us that that is the most worthwhile volunteer uh, activity that they had met. Mm -hmm. And there were people who came and worked with us, people that, who got cured of 20, 30 years of addiction to alcohol. They came and worked with us went and gave these workshops over there telling their own stories mm -hmm. that what we are talking is not hot air only. Mm -hmm. It is something that works. Yeah. And does. they were the witness to it. So to get people in touch with their own thinking brain, the brain that we have, the part of the brain that we have here called prefrontal cortex, that is called the executive brain. And there is a big epidemic of executive disorders mm -hmm. right now. And we got to fix that. And once we fix that, we make even a small dent in that, we make a dent in everything uh, that needs to be done. Beautifully said, Shiva. Um... You know, I, Shiv, beautifully said, one of the things I would put in combination is that when we breathe, 
deeply into in into into the earth and into us and into the earth and into us and we quiet down all of those um, other programming that's sitting inside of us. Exactly. We start to, we actually start to hear other in, insights and information. So uh, we start, we start to actually listen to the trees. We start to listen to the plants. We start to listen to the birds. We start to listen to the earth itself and what she has to say. And so it really, to your point, is, is that we quieten the monkey brain in each of us. Exactly. And, and, and deeply listen into what is natural around us. My greatest counselor is my dog. My dog has incredible intelligence in letting me know what's what about life, as does my plant, Matilda. She's a northern pine. And I, I say these things because you're right. You're absolutely right that we have access to incredible wisdom. We have to just, we have to get out of our own way. And that breathing technique is a powerful vehicle for doing that. Absolutely. It is a, such a powerful technique and uh, it can be taught very easily. Uh, we have all kinds of courses, all kinds of workshops being done in everything other than simple conscious breathing. Mm. And uh, there is a, a big problem with the developmental uh, issues with the kids. Mm -hmm. Kids are growing up with toxic stress. Mm -hmm. uh, they are born with toxic stress inherited from the mother prenatally, mm -hmm. when the kids are being carried by the mothers, the chemicals of in the blood of the mother are going to the blood of the, the kids. So the stress hormone, cortisol, mm -hmm. they're born with high levels of cortisol. So they have all kinds of learning diseases. They, have, they, are, they are marked for criminality for life and disease, uh, and disease for life and poverty. And if you are stressed so badly, mm. you cannot learn. Right. So, and stress causes a lot of diseases. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. was a study done in 2012 that 65 to 85% of primary care doctor's visits are stress related. And yet, Doctors know bugger all about how to relieve stress. Simple deep breathing for 10, 15 minutes a day. You mm -hmm. can manage stress. Yes. Yes. I just want to just ask John, do you have some uh, thoughts about this? I'd love to hear what you think. Well, first off, thank you so much uh, for the beautiful presentation and it's exciting to hear the programs and that you are putting together for sustainability and uh, again uh, changing from sustainability to rejuvenation mm. and restoration and uh, when I my father uh, taught us that we always leave wherever we go better than when we found it, whether it be a campground or a home, uh, plant fruit trees, do a garden, uh, improve the land and, and wherever you are, whether you're renting or whether you're buying a place, leave it better than you found it. And mm. I tried through uh, huge gardens as the kids were growing up, to instill that same uh, honoring and because I was fortunate enough to grow where, up with uh, fam family with farms and ranches where mm. you had to rejuvenate, take some land, do the best you can with it. But uh, it, it is, uh, and it's nice to see my, my children, those that have the property to do it, having my grandsons say, Grandpa, here's a new plant, here's a new crop of, you know, zucchini or whatever it is, but they are learning the same thing to 
to uh, give back to the earth and go out and uh, and help in that. I, you know, unknowingly they're using the word re, you know restorative. It is restorative. It is uh, adding to the positive side. Uh, and, you know, I, I lived at the Grand Canyon before I moved here to Lake Havasu, and my wife and I did, you know, hundreds of hours we uh, of litter pickup, and it was amazing because you see people that are looking at this beautiful vista and then throwing things down with it. like it. It's the unconsciousness, mm-hmm. and that Shiv has shared. Uh, or if we can get into that. Uh, in connection with ourselves through the conscious breathing and as you shared you tap into the collective that way and mm-hmm. thank you again for uh, all the all the beautiful i mean this is a wonderful program i'm thinking of you my daughter-in-law just got her phd and she's doing climate uh, studies and whatnot but it's just it's just it has this enthusiasm for let's make a positive change yes. in the world yes just it just brings me joy to know that we we see just like the news does we see things that are negative but there's such an iron underlying movement around the planet to raise up and uh, and and like say you know when the titanic gets the iceberg what do you do so i i we are a, a swelling up together to lift that uh, Titanic up out of the, buoy it up and, and move forward. So I'm thankful and grateful. Thank you very much for all you do. Leslie, yeah. there is so much uh, wisdom available. Mm-hmm. So much science available, so much technology available. It is not the lack of resources. There's so much money available too. Uh, it's not the lack of resources, it is, in my opinion, is the quality of the uh, of the human resource mm-hmm. that needs to be fixed. Once the human resource quality is upgraded, and education alone, information alone does not do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to you have to teach. Uh, not only the practice, but the why of transformative practices mm-hmm. like breathing that we've been talking about. We mm-hmm. have to teach the physiology of it. We have to teach the psychology of it. We have to teach the neurophysiology of it. Mm-hmm. There are all kinds of ways we can uh, approach this subject. It has to be taught as a science. Yes. And uh, scriptural wisdom is another. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of a um, uh, lot of other things in the scripture because scripture is meant for everybody. Okay, there's a lot of wisdom also, and the scriptural wisdom, the scientific uh, truths, are not a part. They actually converge. I call the convergence of scriptural wisdom and scientific wisdom as holistic science. Mm -hmm. And that holistic science can resolve all kinds of problems. The biggest problem is lack of harmony amongst religions, interfaith harmony, huge problem. Yeah. Environment, huge problem. Disease, physical as well as mental, huge problem. Can you imagine in the richest country of the world, 35, 40,000 people, kids killing each other because of overdosing? Mm. And I don't know how many thousands are killed by guns. Considered to be the most civilized and the richest country or one of the richest countries of the world. There is hardly anything being done to cultivate the mind. And that mind cultivation 
along with the use of science and technology can do wonders. You're totally right. And, it, and, and Shiv, I would say if you were to join one of our, our classes right now, we, we have Kate Rayworth and we've got 350 people in that program from 42 countries. And we are practicing what you're speaking. So I, I think what I find exciting is when I'm in community with those that, that recognize the, 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 the crisis that we're in and find within them the spirit to seek beyond, to use these natural intelligences that we have, this beautiful breath that we're given, and then breathe into this new community. So I would just welcome you to come and join us and, and I would love to. I, and I, I, I just want to say there's there the thing the good news is is that change is happening and we're part of it. And it's exciting to be part of of what is inspiring a new world uh, so that we can say in our rear view mirror, that was the one we created before. This is the one that we're creating now. And it's to very much everything that you've just said are the foundations of what we're doing. So I, I, I think, Leslie, uh, the scale is too small. Uh, it should be all the children that go to school. No question, and, Jeff, no uh, question. Not, not just a tiny fraction of it. I agree to, with you. To, to deal with the global problems, you need huge armies of people with higher levels of consciousness. Yes. Uh, and isn't that part of your World Unity Week? Isn't that what we're trying to do here? Yes. Yes. That is what we are trying to do. It is happening. Yeah. But even World Unity Week will probably reach 0.0001% of the population. It's okay. not the. What, it's what not going to. What has to be done is, is yes. ubiquity university and other universities. Practically all universities should be looking after the fundamental practices that transform, mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than just information transfer. Well, maybe what we should do is is breathe the the breathe in the, those possibilities as we wrap up this session maybe we should breathe in that hope and inspiration and reach all of those that we wish to reach in this change what about it what about that jim <laughs> yeah i uh, i think this has been a good session uh thank you shiv uh, and thank you john for your comments uh leslie and i uh are working on the Masters in Regenerative Action on a daily basis with a growing coalition of groups around the world. Uh, we look forward to further collaboration with World Unity Week and um, appreciate the opportunity to share with uh, everyone, uh, whether in this chat session or Zoom session or watching on Facebook with what we believe is the key word uh, and a uh, key ethos for the world right now, and that is to move very energetically to regenerate um, that which we've so badly broken uh, so that we can ensure the human future uh, for not only us, uh, but for the children yet unborn under the seventh generation. So thank you, everyone. It's been a marvelous session. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, uh, we appreciate your time and, and commitment. And uh, thank you, Leslie. It's always a pleasure. All the best. <laughs> thank you very much, Jim and Leslie and John. Yeah. Bye thank bye. You. Best to you. Bye. bye. Thanks, John. That was the end of our session. Richard, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Do you, we um, just keep the room open now? The the uh, what should I do? Do we do you do we have some music or something that you can play in the room? No, I couldn't get anything from um, uh, Becky or uh, uh, Gary. 
I was just I, about I, to text Gary and find yeah, out again, yeah. but I, oh, wait a minute, I could add something. Hold on, I got something. Yeah. Jim and uh, Leslie got done half hour too soon. They were scheduled hey, for 90 minutes. Okay, I'll put on some music. Can you please, thank you. Yep. And uh, I'm not supposed to be on until three o'clock, so um, we have an hour to fill and maybe uh, we can share a uh, um, whiteboard saying that uh, we'll be back at three o'clock. Okay, you want to create one and I'll cr okay, put the I'll, music up? I'll, I'll go to the, my uh, other computer and create one and you can um, get the music started yep. and uh, people can see what is happening and they can go away for lunch or dinner or washroom break. Oh, okay, Richard, thank you very much. I'll, I'll go on the, on the other computer and create the whiteboard.
Hi, Shiv. Hi, uh, Richard. Uh, can we show the whiteboard and some music at the same time? No, probably not. No, it's showing, Zeb. They're, the whiteboard's up and the music. Music is uh, working? Yeah, the I music. Don't hear the, I don't hear the music. It, it, it went silent when he got. Yeah, I, it seems like I, I can't hear the music, too. I can hear you and I speak, but I can't hear the music. Yeah, you're anyways, right. The music's anyways, not playing. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll come back a little bit sooner, uh, but we'll um, I make my presentation at three o'clock as originally planned. I don't know whether, uh, how many people will show up, but it doesn't matter how many show up. I will do it at three as scheduled. Yeah, I can open up with some music for you if you want, Shiv. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, so I'll put up some Claire Hiles music, a piano piece. Yeah, okay. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll mute now, Shiv. I'll see you there too. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Hey, I'll Sean. Take a break and have a little bite. Hey, Sean. John, yes. Okay. The, um, you know, I dropped the link into Facebook and it worked perfectly for people that are trying to put the, uh, put it out on their Facebook page. Yeah, I will maybe put mine on the Facebook page. Um, and my other uh, computer in the room in my office is, uh, um, is the, um, is a co-host, so I cannot do that. I cannot do it from the host machine. So I'll work from, I'll take this computer by that. Okay. In my office. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, okay. Shiv. Bye. All right.
Hello, hello, hello.
Shiv, do you want me to play some music? Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, we we'll, we have another ten minutes to. Can you hear me, Shiv? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me, Shiv? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I can hear you now. Okay. Do you want me to play some music? Please do. Thank you.
you want me to play for a couple minutes, Sev, while people come yeah. in and then yeah, I'll turn maybe, it off? Maybe play for five minutes. Okay. And then maybe you can look after letting people in and meeting people. Yeah. If you're waiting in the waiting room. Sure. Uh, you, get, you get a message on the screen. Thank you. Well, we are live on Facebook. Um, I guess we can get started. Um, my name is Shiv Tharwar, and I am uh, a member of Spiritual Heritage Education Network. Um, the topic for today uh, that we are dealing with is envisioning the future of education. Um, and I'm going to share the screen with you. And what we have done is uh, we have done that envisioning and uh, um, we've created a uh, a formal proposal uh, for the policymakers and administrators of education. 
system and governance in the world to institute a contemplative learning of unity in diversity. Um, the learning that we are talking about is what we call holistic science, which emerges with the um, with the um, connection of spiritual science and scientific wisdom. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in the scripture of the world, and we have to mine that wisdom. And uh, that wisdom, doesn't matter which scripture you look at, the wisdom is the same. And that wisdom merges with uh, scientific wisdom. So from the <clears throat> union of scripture and science, or scriptural wisdom and scientific wisdom, I should say, um, emerges holistic uh, science, which can be used to solve all, call, all kinds of uh, human problems that we face today. And these human problems are of global scale. The first problem that I have listed is executive disorders. No matter where you go, people do not think that they have their life in their control. They are not their own lives conscious executive. So uh, as a result, there are all kinds of executive disorders which prevent them from a purposeful life. They live a life of uh, uh, instinctive demands and th those that life is separative, it is divisive. So because of the emphasis on instinctive living in the world, we have a whole host of uh, reasons for people to feel divided. There is no word unity and the problem of word unity is so evasive, evasive because of instinctive lives. Uh, so because of executive disorders, we have learning disorders. And we have disorders of mental and physical health. We have a lot of criminality, racism. There are problems of peace in the world and harm, harmonious living in the world. There is no harmony within an individual, the individual feels fragmented himself. The families are fragmented, communities are fragmented, and the world is fragmented. There's a lot of mistrust and greed resulting in unending conflicts, exploitation of the natural environment, and poverty. There's a lot of uh, uh, richness in the world, so a lot of riches, abundant. Uh, there's a lot of abundance, but that is being uh, monopolized by a few. There is no sharing. As a result, there's a lot of poverty. And the people uh, who are poor, poor, they're poor because of executive disorders, more so than, than um, their fate. Um, so we can resolve all those humongous problems which have been evading the world for a, since eternity if the schools teach the holistic wisdom contemplatively along with practices to raise human consciousness to acquire it. Teaching uh, is just passing on information is not good enough. We also have to teach the practices that uh, 
that attenuate instinctive living so that human consciousness is raised above them. The natural inbuilt instincts keep us divided. Not only they keep us divided, they keep us enslaved. We don't think of anything meaningful. We don't think of any higher purpose other than our own survival, sustenance, procreation, and ego identity. Um, so this is what the proposal is all about in a nutshell. We'll go into details. Uh, a discussion, this is what the scope of the presentation is. I try to make this, uh, say it in one sentence, discussion of how contemplative learning of unity and diversity can generate the power of inclusion to resolve the ever evasive problem of word unity. And that's the problem we are addressing today in this word unity week, I would say mega conference. There are over 30 rooms such as ours where uh, word unity is being talked about and a lot of activities going on simultaneously and uh, the purpose, the idea is that even if that there are not too many in-person uh, listeners at any given time in any given room, we live broadcast it on Facebook so that these videos will stay there and people can watch it uh, at infinitum. Uh, last year's, um, uh, last year's World Unity Week uh, videos that are there on, on Facebook, I'm told, been watched by thousands of people. Uh, we, the proposal that we were talking about, the vision, the future of education, contemplative learning of unity and diversity, a proposal for the attention of stakeholders in governance and education, for holistic cultivation of the self, for world unity, peace, harmony, health, individual, and planetary wellness. And this proposal, this statement and executive summary is available uh, at this link. And you click this link and you can download the proposal. I, I'll put this link in the chat uh, for you to take away and you can download your own copy and read it at your pleasure and uh, give us your opinion and the suggestions for uh, improving uh, this formal um, uh, work. Uh, so that's what this uh, uh, talk is all about. So, what is wrong with the existing education? Why do we need to change education to include contemplative learning of unity and diversity? And here are some of the reasons. Goal of education, the current education is focused on survival. So you learn how to read, write, and do arithmetic so that you can survive and how to make money, learn some skill, uh, to make money so that you can put food on the table. So survival is the only uh, goal of current education. And what we are saying is survival is not enough. Uh, we want to cultivate the conscious sense of self of the students so that they can survive in health and harmony. So we are adding to the existing goals, uh, health and harmony, survival, not only mere survival, but survival in health, harmony, exuberance, and abundance. Um, and that would be the new set of goals to be achieved by education as envisioned here. Uh, 
So primary focus of education is number one, the current education. Uh, number two is not addressed adequately. As a result, humanity suffers from widespread maladies such as hostile genetic disposition. Uh, hostility is built into the genes because of survival. Uh, I don't want to be shot. I don't want to be killed. I want to keep me safe from all kinds of risks and dangers. So if I see the other, I see him as a risk to my life or a risk to my property or a risk, risk to my identity or whatever it may be. So that hostility is built into our genes. The brain is structured in a way that we only think of the other as hostile to us. Hostility is of the against the other, is kind of again um, hardwired uh, in the neural circuits of the brain. Uh, we have, as a result of the first two, we have, we undergo a lot of stress and they are the reason for gene degenerative physical disease and impairments in mental health. There's a pandemic of mental health all around the world. People are uh, killing themselves because of depression. They want to escape the world they, and they, they take uh, drugs and overdosing on drugs. They can uh, committing suicides by the thousands in the, in the, in the most civilized, uh, the most richest, uh, richest countries of the world. We have a whole host of learning impairments, executive disorders, criminality in the so-called civilized countries, there are more policemen uh, to uh, stop people from criminality. Criminality should not be uh, commonplace uh, if people pay attention to their level of consciousness and if they learn the techniques that can raise their consciousness above survival. Survival means survival, sustenance, procreation, and, uh, and ego identity. Um, because of degenerative diseases of the body and the mind um, and malformed brains, there's a lot of poverty. Um, Little insects can find food to survive. We as intelligent human beings, we are poor. We cannot find food to survive. It's not that we choose to be poor. It is just that we have created inner environment in such a way that we become poor. We cannot seem to help ourselves. There's a lot of racism lot of division based upon any differences. Uh, we divide humanity into a million different ways. And one group of humanity is against the other group of humanity. The biggest um, crime, I think, is that of racism, uh, hostility uh, against people of other races and religions and whatever else, maltreatment, violence, high rate of failure, and school dropouts, ethnic and democratic disparities, al alcoholism and substance addiction. We have some a fair bit of experience of alcoholism and substance addiction. 
because we were giving workshops in raising human consciousness at the local hospital in their addiction management um, wing. And people used to come there to dry themselves out. They were addicted to alcohol and they could not figure out how to help themselves, but they wanted to help themselves to get out of it. And we worked there as volunteers and we taught uh, this practice of raising their consciousness and connecting them with their own thinking brain. And that's all we did. We taught them this simple uh, exercise, uh, uh, simple practice, and they realized, and we made them do it in our presence. And many of them realized that this practice can help them. And they were doing it regularly. As a result, they got out of their addictive habits of 10, 15, 20 years. So, you know, there are other associated problems with alcoholism. If we can deal with alcoholism with this little practice of raising your consciousness, we can deal with other problems as well. Uh, exclusive and reductionist tendencies, of course, we talked about it. Uh, compulsive tendencies, compulsion or um, addiction, you can say, practically the same thing. Um, we can get out of those compulsive tendencies with, by raising human consciousness. Obesity, irresponsible consumption, huge disease of the rich, a lot of hypertension and high glucose levels in the blood. Um, huge, and all this can is totally unnecessary uh, with the practice that we are talking about. Contemplative practices in general will do that, but this one practice, which is science, which has got evidence of science behind it, uh, that can uh, effectively work uh, in a foolproof way. You cannot go wrong with that practice. Lack of emotional intelligence. We react, our behavior is so reactive that we can do horrendous things and then sit back and see what the hell did I do uh, after the fact. Uh, that is what is lack of emotional intelligence. Emotions, we get carried away by it and we don't use our emotions intelligently. And there's a fair bit of us versus them conflicts all around the world and exploitation of nature uh, is of uh, epidemic level again. Uh, we are told we don't have much time. We have to learn to be uh, sustainable in the use of natural resources. Uh, if we are not, uh, the planet is getting too warm too fast and we won't be able to survive. There's not too much time left. Uh, we have to act fast. And so raising of human consciousness above the survival instincts can help us deal with all these uh, huge problems that we are facing. So what does the proposed solution look like? What are we proposing? There are some quotes I start with. Ideas we don't know we have, have us. We become compulsively addicted to those ideas. We are not even know that we are there that those ideas are there in our genes because of the inheritance of our inbuilt instincts. Instincts are 
uh, inbuilt, inbuilt into us when we are born on, or not when we are born, when we are conceived, we have learned a few things. Nobody teaches us so many things that we know instinctively, okay? Our instincts give us a, a start in our life. Without them, we cannot survive. They are necessary. But they work on us unknowingly. We have no control on them. Although on one side, they um, help us survive. On the other side, they take charge of our lives. They run our lives. We just become their slaves. Uh, so they start to possess us. Ideas we don't know we have, have us. Wholeness, a state in which consciousness and unconscious work together in harmony. That is what is called wholeness by a psychologist, where the unconscious and the conscious work in harmony. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. This is Carl Gustav Jung, the famous psychotherapist and psychologist. Um, here I have shown an iceberg, which is metaphor for mind. Uh, about 10% of the iceberg is showing, showing above the surface of the ocean. And 90% is below the surface of the ocean. The one that is immediately below the surface of the ocean is subconscious. And then way below is the unconscious mind. So this is the unconscious mind. And the memory that comprises the unconscious mind that is inherited by us from our ancestors in the line of evolution. And that memory is sitting here, but that memory is not static. It just keeps moving from the unconscious, goes into the subconscious, from the subconscious into the unconscious, so that movement, that bubbling up into the, from the unconscious into the subconscious is happening all the time. And also there's bubbling up from the subconscious into the conscious and from the conscious into the subconscious. That bubbling up and down is going on all the time. So when we are sitting and doing nothing, this is where we get all the ideas. We get maybe, uh, God knows how many ideas, maybe a thousand ideas a minute. It is the bubbling up, uncontrolled, random bubbling up of a memory, memory into our subconscious memory into our consciousness. We cannot sit and think of nothing. There's always something in our mind. And that's where that comes from. It is the random movement of the memory from the unconscious into the subconscious, from the subconscious into the conscious. And if somehow we can stop that or reduce the movement of the memory from the conscious into subconscious and so on. If we can somehow reduce it, we do ourselves a big favor. That is called raising your consciousness. Your consciousness then is free to think of something more than mere survival. Otherwise, all you can think of is what I'm going to eat, uh, with who I'm going to sleep, what I'm going to drink, what kind of alcohol should I buy, what kind of beer should I buy, 
you know, what kind of uh, um, place I want to go and visit because I'm so tired of working, I'm bored, I, I need some vacation. It's always oriented towards life, survival, not real life. But we, we never think of how can I be more loving or how can I be more compassionate? You can't be loving and compassionate just by thought. You can become so by raising your consciousness. And that is a scientific activity. Uh, we'll talk about it as we go along. Ordinary life is run by the unconscious and the subconscious mind constantly seducing human consciousness until it is completely enslaved by them. If I'm going too fast, stop me. Not too many people. Feel free to ask questions and discuss. And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, I'm just going to go at my, uh, my speed. So that is something that contemplative learning has to deal with. Natural lives and the robbing of free will. Where is the freedom of will if all we can think is survival? Let's say you want to, you are so ambitious, you want to become a medical doctor. And if all you can, we can think is good times that we are going to have today. That is instinctive living. We cannot postpone that. Or let me wait until I become a medical doctor. You cannot have any ambition, any purpose, which is much more than mere survival having a good time today, having this and having that, and enjoying this and enjoying that, this kind of emotion, that kind of emotion. Uh, so natural human life is run by survival instincts located in our phylogenetic memory. You know, it's, phylogenetics is the study of how we acquire our instincts. And that's a, a study in genetic biology. Uh, one of the students that's been helping me in this, uh, he's going to be presenting after I, and he will talk uh, science and genetics and biology with you and show you uh, how powerful phylogenetic memory is and how it hijacks our mind and how we can save it from being hijacked. It controls the unconscious represented by the brain stem. Brain stem is the part of the brain that deals with the unconscious uh, mind. That is the representative of the unconscious mind. Brain is the tool of the mind, okay? The brain stem is the tool of the unconscious mind. And then, the subconscious mind is represented by the amygdala in the limbic brain. Okay, brain stem is just a little bit, little bit above the, the spine uh, at the bottom of the, uh, that's the lowest part of the brain. And then a little bit higher than that is the limbic structure, the limbic group of uh, neural structures and amygdala are uh, two almond-sized neural, uh, uh, you know, uh, tissue that deal with all our emotions. For example, anger, fear, um, sex, whatnot. You can say any if anything to deal with emotions other than the emotions of pure love and compassion. That is not the limbic thought. Limbic thought is, uh, feels is only the fear that is self-oriented or selfishness oriented, selfish emotions. Uh, and natural instincts are 
very highly related with selfish emotions. Uh, and then there we have uh, what I call noble emotions of love and compassion. And that is not, they, they don't, do not come under the scope of the limbic brain. And, and the subconscious and the unconscious, they enslave and hijack the conscious mind. And conscious mind is represented by the neocortex. That is the hat we wear on just under the skull, okay? And the, the front part of it, like this part here, is called the uh, prefrontal cortex. And that's where all the thinking happens. That's where love is generated. That's where compassion is generated. So the uh, noble uh, emotions are in the, are the scope of the, the, the thinking brain, not the emotional um, uh, brain that deals with the selfish emotions. Uh, the survival instincts are responsible for high autonomic demands of the body, as well as high emotional demands of the subconscious mind. Now, this is where we get caught. Survival instincts are responsible for high autonomic demands. They make us breathe faster. They make our heart pump faster. They make the blood flow in our veins at a higher speed and in a turbulent way, not in a smooth laminar way. And they make our uh, stomach digest food slowly. So our digestive system is slow, our heart pumping blood like crazy, our lungs breathing air like crazy, shallow breaths, but a lot of breaths per minute. So that is what is happening because of survival instincts. You can say survival instincts, they uh, run our life. The survival functions of our life, uh, our body and mind at a higher clip. Okay. And if we don't slow down, we cause ourselves a whole host of physical and mental problems. And not only host of physical and mental problems, uh, problems of behavior, problems of learning, problems of uh, emotional intelligence, uh, all kinds of disorders. Uh, and they keep us apart from each other. So if we want to help control our instinctive life, all we need to do is reduce the autonomic demands of the body. And there's a way to do it, and we will learn that as we go along. High physiological and emotional demands of the body, mind, generate instantaneous reflex response by the brain stem an immediate reactive response by the amygdala. So the response is essentially reflex response, which is instantaneous, and reactive responses, which are immediate, and they don't need any consideration, no thinking, no mindfulness. So in other words, we are behaving mindlessly. That is why uh, they invented mindfulness meditation to control that unmindful uh, activity. Freeing the conscious from the slavery of our survival instincts is the key to the desired self-cultivation. And self-cultivation for survival and health and harmony is largely ignored by the ego. And that's what we are saying we should be in, in redress. We, it should be part of the, uh, the 
goals of education to uh, cultivate the self and to cultivate the mind so that uh, we can behave with concentration. So what qualifies me to make this kind of proposal? Here are some of the issues uh, that make me uh, work in this direction. I was drawn to it by the way my life unfolded, you can say. Here, when I was 10 years of age, you see all these refugees migrating from one part of the world to the other because of human cruelty towards others. And then partition of 1947, I lived through it. And for months and months, I saw these signs of these uh, uh, people, refugees moving with whatever they had in whichever way they could on top of the train, underneath hanging from the carriages, overflowing the carriages themselves and uh, walking. And so many died on the way because India was divided on the basis of religion. Uh, Pakistan was carved out of India for the Muslim people and the rest of India was for the Muslims and the others. Uh, all the Muslims could not fit in Pakistan because uh, you know we have still in India more Muslim people than in Pakistan itself, but that's what happened. The result is the, the Hindus were driven out of the now Pakistan and some of the neighboring areas of India drove the Muslims from there towards Pakistan. So that is what you're seeing here, the scenes. And I was 10 years of age at that time and I realized uh, in my mind, that's craziness. Religion, which is supposed to take you towards God, uh, and which is supposed to be all merciful, is that the result of his mercy? Uh, so I decided in my uh, stupid mind that I must do something about it. And I didn't know what the hell to do until I met this man in 19, uh, what, 41. No, 1978, 1941, I was only four years of age. 1978, I was 41, and I met him on my birthday, 41st birthday. And he taught me that this kind of problems arise in religion because people do not understand religion. So there's a lot of spiritual, unifying spirituality spiritual wisdom in religion, if you want to prevent this thing from happening, educate or work for education in that core unifying spirituality of religion, that core wisdom of religion. And that's what I started working on after retirement on a full-time basis, but that was my my search, lifelong search. So I'm a technologist by profession, civil engineer. So I have a problem solving mind and I look at things in a scientific way. It doesn't make sense to me. I just throw it out. It doesn't matter whether which book it comes from. Um, I have uh, very little religious conditioning. So I had nothing to unlearn. I was not religiously conditioned at all. And if I was, it was to a very small extent. So I didn't have much to unlearn. So I established this organization in year 2000. And, and since then I've been working full-time. Actually my work, full-time work started in 1996, but in 2000, this organization uh, officially started to exist and, and uh, I've been working, you can say, as a researcher in the background 
my work is uh, in the back office most of the time because it's study, 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 and research, 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 right? And uh, it's only lately that I started to go and talk about my work because I figured that if I keep on working, nobody knows about what you're doing, then uh, uh, you're not going to succeed in, in your purpose. Uh, so I started uh, researching. My research has been published in you know more than ten papers on uh, in um, academic journals and scholarly journals uh, of spirituality. There was a journal. There was a journal being published by the University of Toronto called the Journal of Ultimate Reality and Meaning. A lot of my publications are in that journal. Uh, and uh, some in other journals also. And I started publishing a journal myself on, under the under our organization. And I do some writing for that. And I wrote a book. And that book got me uh, International Books for Peace Award in 2020. Uh, and uh, that, that book was called uh, um, a masterpiece on the unity of science and spirituality. And uh, the, uh, uh, the proposal to envision education uh, of the future is based upon essentially the application of that book. Uh, so the envisaged education, the proposed education is uh, based upon research unifying scriptural wisdom with the utmost findings of modern science. So that's what this book is about. Uh, utmost, what is utmost scriptural wisdom? The perceptible universe of immense diversity is from an imperceptible principle called spirit. A spirit is the subtlest principle. It's so subtle that you cannot see it, even with the uh, most powerful microscope money can buy or science can build. It is invisible. It is uh, um, like uh, this uh, um, virus that is going around. It's also very subtle. It is uh, the size of uh, micrometers or micrometers to nanometers. Uh, but this virus can be seen with uh, electron microscopes, but not with the naked eye. Spirit cannot be seen with the most powerful electron microscopes. So it can only be represented by a point. Point is, has got zero dimensions, length zero, width zero, and depth zero. Okay, and from that point, spirit starts to concretize and, okay, that's what, uh, the spiritual wisdom is, and it is there in every scripture. And then scientific finding, the perceptible universe of immense diversity is from the imperceptible principle called energy. So science calls it energy. Religion calls it spirit. Okay, just the words. And they're both the principles, both the, uh, uh, you know, it's actually the same principle. There cannot be more than one infinite and infinite decimal at the same time uh, principle in the world. Uh, and and that such a principle is omnipresent. That's why, you know, God is a metaphor used for that principle. Okay, because most of us, do not understand um, uh, something unseen 
leading to such a humongous universe of 92 billion light years across, coming from a point with no dimensions of itself. So spirit is thought to be an indivisible unity of consciousness and energy. Consciousness more, uh, you know, uh, animating the mind and energy animating the body. Consciousness is set to activate the mind while energy is set to form and, and animate the material body. But they, these two are considered to be an indivisible unity, just two in the matter of words, but in essence, the two is one. That's like the two sides of a coin. One is called head, the other is called tail. Uh, and that is what uh, the idea here is. There is no mind without body and no body without mind, whether you're talking of matter or you're talking of in, um, uh, uh, any person with life, a creature or an animal. Uh, or vegetation is supposed to have life. Um, everything, including matter, which is considered to be inanimate, also has got mind. Otherwise, it will have, it, it, it cannot exhibit any behavior. We talk of the behavior of matter, matter um, reacts with other matter and it does not react with some others. So it is able to distinguish which one is compatible, which one is not. So it binds with compatible matter and it leaves the incompatible matter alone. So there is no body without mind and no mind without body. Mind is on the interior, running the behavior of the perceptible body on the exterior. but not controlling. Mind is supposed to run the behavior of the body in human beings and in and that exhibit mind in the way the humans and the anime do. The mind is running the behavior, but not controlling it a hundred percent there's a freedom of uh, choice also uh, in matter the control is maybe you can say uh, more absolute matter is supposed to be deterministic deterministic means there is all, there are always set ways of behavior whereas a human being uh, Determinism controls human beings only if uh, humans are leading a natural life. If they use their mind and consideration, they can control their own behavior. So the mind runs the behavior of the body the, with the difference of determinism and the degree of determinism to which uh, it does. So interiority cannot be separated from exteriority, therefore mind cannot be separated from body. It is in the nature of the mind to cognize and respond to every perception. So there's, the, there's a stimulus, there's a response. That is what is called behavior. And minds are built so that they respond to every stimulus, everything that they perceive with their eyes, um, with, with, we perceive with our eyes, or we taste, or we perceive with our noses, or hear, we respond to it. Imperceptible energy manifests through the physical body and imperceptible consciousness through the mind. Just like mind is not uh, is considered to be non-corporeal. Uh, we cannot see mind. Mind can feel itself, can 
perceive itself, but I cannot perceive your mind, but you can perceive my body. Okay? So imperceptible energy manifests through the physical body and the imperceptible consciousness is perceived through the mind. My consciousness, I know my mind is conscious. I, I know what my mind is conscious of at this particular time. Um, so that is what makes my mind conscious is called the consciousness uh, principle. Uh, spirit, the indivisible unity of the two manifests itself through the body mind union. Okay. And the indivisibility of the, of the body, uh, uh, sorry, uh, indivisibility of energy and consciousness is also shown by uh, this uh, allegory. Uh, spirit energy and consciousness are ineffable. Nothing can definitely be said about them because they are not perceptible by our senses. I can perceive electrical energy, I can perceive heat energy, but what is energy I cannot perceive. Until energy takes a form, I cannot perceive it. Energy becomes my body, I can perceive it. Energy becomes uh, this cup, I can perceive it, okay? Uh, but energy itself, no physicist can define what energy is. Just like nobody, no religious person can define what spirit is. It is there, uh, we know, but we don't know what it is. Consciousness imparts uh, to the mind the ability to perceive and know, while energy imparts to the matter the ability to be and become. Energy becomes matter. Einstein's E equals MC squared. And matter can become energy, while consciousness, matter can become energy, as shown in the atomic bomb. A few pounds of uh, plutonium. You split the nucleus, nuclei of that, and you get so much energy that you, you can burn the whole big city. Of, uh, while consciousness does not become mind, it only makes it come alive. Consciousness does not become mind. Energy does become matter. Consciousness only makes mind come alive, animates it. Thus, energy changes while consciousness stays the same. Change is the movement. Energy can move and not see, while consciousness can see but cannot move. That is what, what this allegory comes from. There's a, a lame person that cannot walk. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's right. A lame person that cannot walk and a person that can walk but cannot see. The lame person has got, cannot walk but he's got eyes. So he can tell the person who can walk cannot see. Blind man who cannot see, he can point him in the direction of where to go. So the two actually, you can say this person that cannot walk is the metaphor, and but can see is the metaphor for consciousness. And the person that can move but cannot see, that is the metaphor for energy. So the union of that which can move or change and the other which cannot move and change, stays constant all the time. So it's the mingling of the two, the union of the opposites. That's what spirit is. So metaphysics 
scriptural and scientific principles, the subtle is the cause and the controller of the concrete. That is essentially a fundamental principle. Whenever science does any research, the first thing a science laboratory buys is a microscope. Things that cannot be seen, see them, study them. Okay, that is research. Uh, because it is the subtle that is more comprehensive, you know, the subtler the principle is, a principle is more comprehensive is the principle. So this is one of the principles of spirituality. And it's also the principle of science and also the principle of metaphysics. Subtle is related with comprehensiveness. The higher the subtlety, the higher the comprehensiveness, the infinite subtle. Infinitely subtle is the cause of the entirety of existence. With that principle, this principle, uh, you can say they're all related. The infinitely subtle, which has got no dimension at all, not even in micro inches or sextillionth of an inch. Um, a principle, the particle of which has got no size, zero length, zero breadth, zero height. That is what is the infinitely subtle. So that infinitely subtle is not only the source of all existence, it is immanence holds everything together. Like in every atom, if we look at science, it's easier to explain in terms of science, uh, the omnipresence of the subtlest. Um, if you look at Every atom, every atom is composed of what? Uh, three kinds of particles, neutron, proton, and electron. Electrons carry a negative charge. A proton carries, protons carry a positive charge of the same quantity as an electron does, but protons a lot heavier. And then there's a neutron that carries no charge also as heavy as the proton is. So protons and neutrons are collected and they become the nucleus of the atom. Imagine something that repels each other. Protons repel each other because they got positive charge and they are in a tight collection called the nucleus of the atom, and around the nucleus run around negatively charged neutrons. So what holds the protons together that normally would repel each other? Energy. What keeps the electrons circling around the nucleus? Again, energy. So every, energy, every atom has got energy in its nucleus, and energy around the nucleus. Without energy in the form of uh, potential and uh, kinetic energy, I think it's kinetic energy more than potential energy here in that form is holding the every atom together without energy holding the integrity of the atom together there'll be no atom and there'll be no matter. So that is, is it is easier to explain it that way, but the omnipresence of spirit has been known and people argued about it uh, for thousands of years. And uh, it's hard to explain those arguments, easier to explain in terms of chemistry. So 
the beauty of holistic science that we are talking about is that you can talk about spirituality in scientific terms and about science in spiritual terms. People don't want to uh, listen to spiritual terminology, but people are ready to listen to scientific terminology. So you can teach spirituality in scientific ways. That is the beauty of holistic science that I'm talking about. And that is a major part of my book, The Common Ground, that I published. Now, this is what is me, a point from which I emerge. This point, from this point, the spirit starts to concretize. And as I go towards the left, at each point, the concretization is more and more and more. And on the outside, this is the human body, my body, you can say it. That body is concrete. You can it's apparent to you. You can look at my body and tell who it is. But the concretization of the infinitely subtle spirit, gradual concretization at every point, there is a more and more and more higher and higher concretization going on until my body becomes visible. Essentially, this is how the big blast, uh, big bang works. Energy, a huge big bang, uh, an expanding universe develops. The same kind of a model, that is what is called metaphysics. This is metaphysics. Formation of perceptible universe from an imperceptible spirit. It is a kind of gradual concretization, you can say, gradual growth. Uh, so from the spirit, first becomes, first perceptible thing is the mind. Mind is from here to here. This is the mind. This is the first perceptible thing. Mind can be perceived by my mind can perceive my mind. I cannot perceive your mind. Okay? So it's that kind of perception. And body obviously is perceptible through the eyes. I can touch you, I can see you. But then there here, the subtlety is so high that we don't know what it is. It's total mystery here. Just like spirit is a total mystery, this part is a total mystery, but it's part of me. So there is my senses, and there's my ego, and there's my intellect. Intellect is divided into two parts. One is the rational part of the intellect. Rational part of the intellect is that part of the intellect which got definiteness about it. It is, it is related with my sensory experience. If I, my eyes see this as a cup, then this is a cup. It cannot be anything else. That kind of definite knowledge results from sense perception, okay? So intellect that is related with definite knowledge. Okay, that's called the rational part of the intellect. It's towards the sensory faculty, and then beyond the sensory faculty towards this spiritual mystery, this part of the intellect calls wisdom, okay? This will accommodate conflicts. It can accommodate differences. It is more inclusive part of the intellect, whereas this is more exclusive part of the intellect. So you can say, Intellect has got an, an exclusive region and an inclusive region. People who do not discriminate on the basis of religion or race or gender or gender orientation, 
they have cultivated this part here. And people who see things as us and them, they are strong in this part only. Okay. Wisdom you cultivate when you transcend rational intellect. Okay. And uh, in Arabic, in Islam, Islam, uh, in uh, Islam, the, they use the word nafs for the whole region from sensory faculty to the end of rational intellect. The word is nafs. So I put that in. This is the divisive part. Sensory faculty divides. My eyes say this is A, this is B, this is C. It is essential for me to decide whether it's an A or a B or a C for survival. Otherwise, I will not learn three R's. And ego is essential for survival. If I don't have any ego identity, I cannot survive. And rational intellect is necessary for survival. Wisdom is not necessary for survival. Okay. But if you are wise, you live in harmony and, and health. Okay. And happiness. And with a lot of energy. So, and this took for me to exist today is 14 and a half billion years of unconscious and subconscious memory, both unifying and divisive, okay? Mostly divisive, divisive memory is most recent. That's when our eyes grew and our ears grew and noses grew. Sensory faculty, it, you know, it, all life has got, even vegetative life has got some kind of sensing mechanism. But the five senses that we have got are the most developed form of sensory faculty. Okay. And, but that is all divisive part. It works automatically. My eyes see automatically. And my mind reacts to it automatically. So, uh, but I have also experienced that one time, 14 and a half billion years ago, I was spirit out of which everything comes from. That's the unity of the whole existence. And that also is somewhere there in my genes. And we got to search for it. And that search, this wisdom, and you need this wisdom to complete that search. We have to push our rational intellect to its limits so that it transcends itself and becomes wisdom. Mind, knowledge, understanding, and the whole truth. Learning is a three-step process. Learning begins with a cognitive process of listening, Sight, taste, touch, and smell. That's where learning begins. The second step is reflection, in which we recall, review, and relearn the content of the first step. Okay. So, cognitive process of listening, seeing, tasting, touching, and smelling. That's where information goes in and information is converted into understanding through reflection. So if we relate with the people, kids going to school, kids going to school, listen to the teacher, that is cognitive learning. They come home with a whole lot of um, problems to solve and homework, and in that, you review and you relearn what you heard and you learn it more deeper, okay? 
but that reflection is happening when you sit down and you try to learn. You have to make an effort. This is effortless. You just go to school and your ears are going to hear the teacher. If you make an effort to pay attention, you will hear a little bit better. Here, definitely you need, uh, you need uh, uh, to uh, uh, work uh, <clears throat> to uh, review and relearn. And then these two are happening only while dealing with the instincts. So instincts are popping in and you still try to learn through reflection. And then the, there's a third step. These two steps are good enough for learning to survive, learning a trade, learning the three R's and all that stuff. So that you can go to work, you can survive, you can buy groceries and figure out how much, what would be your bill, you can make a budget and that kind of learning is these two steps are enough, okay? But then if something more abstract you want to learn, you have to contemplate. In contemplation, I'll show you the basis of contemplation. In contemplation, you quieten the instinctive memory. And there, that process is uh, the process of raising your consciousness and, uh, and that process we'll talk about. And you do that process, quieten the mind and free it from the random uh, bubbling of the instinctive memory from your genes into your conscious mind, okay? And then with that quietened mind, then you think of the learning of the first two steps, and then you can find things that you cannot see in the first two steps, okay? And that is how most research is done. But that is how Einstein came up with uh, his, uh, his scientific research was all contemplated because he didn't have a lab. He was only a clerk in a patent office, had not seen the inside of a lab, but he did work which no experimental scientist could do because experimental scientist depends upon what he sees in his experiment. It's just a more sense-oriented uh, knowledge, cognitive knowledge, than <coughs> contemplative knowledge. So contemplative knowledge goes much, much, much deeper. Einstein alone came up uh, with his research of E equal to MC squared. No experiment could have taken you there. Einstein came up with the general theory of relativity. Einstein came up with the groundbreaking work in quantum mechanics. No experimental physics can, uh, physicists can take you there. So this is our natural waking state, okay, where there's a lot of bubbling of the genetic memory, unconscious genetic memory into subconscious and subconscious into the conscious. A lot of distraction of the mind. Okay, so you want to quieten this distraction, reduce it. Okay, and this is state of quiet reflection. You sit and you focus on the homework, and that reduces the bubbling, random bubbling of the uh, subconscious and the consciousness. Okay, and then focused mind and cannot, your mind cannot be focused even with this much random bubbling 
from the genetic memory into the conscious memory. You have to reduce it way down. And you reduce it way down, uh, and that can be done with conscious breathing. Conscious breathing is the practice that I was alluding to, to raise your consciousness from this heavy bubbling of the instinctive memory into your consciousness, to enslave your consciousness. Okay, you reduce that way down, and when it is reduced way down, then if you start focusing on any other subject, that is called contemplative learning. Okay, and in contemplative learning, you will find things that you could not find in normal waking state of cognitive learning or in reflective learning. In reflective learning, uh, this random bubbling of the, of the unconscious and the subconscious and the consciousness is, mild, is milder than normal waking state. And here it is way reduced way further. Okay. And if you contemplate on anything with that state, even this little bit of bubbling will disappear. And all that you will then have in your mind is the object of contemplation. If you're contemplating on quantum physics, you will have nothing else in mind, nothing bothering you, nothing distracting your mind, then your attention will con uh, and, uh, on uh, uh, quantum physics and you'll come up with so many things that you will not otherwise come up with. And this learning, rocks and waters, etc., are words of God. Use the word spirit instead of God. God is a metaphor used for spirit. And so are men. We all flow from the same soul. All are expressions of one love. So seeing unity of existence, unity underlying existence of all kinds, this is contemplative learning, cannot happen in any other way. And contemplative learning is your own insight. So then this becomes practical. If I give you some advice, uh, do this, don't do that. It is, these are my words, not your experience, not your insight. If the thought comes from your insight, then that thought is practical. It compels you to act on it. Okay, so contemplative learning is practical learning. Mind, knowledge, and understanding, sensory faculty of the mind is meant to perceive and respond during our waking state. Perception with the organs of cognition is the beginning of knowledge and understanding. We refer to this knowledge as rational. The organs of cognition are limited to perceive definite objects within the range of common human experience. So that's what you will learn in the first two steps. All objects of knowledge are not within the range of common human experience, perception, therefore out of reach of the sensory faculty. And how do you learn those objects? Contemplative, okay? This is when you start contemplating, focusing your mind on an object of contemplation. And then here you see no bubbling of the random memory, random genetic memory into your consciousness. Here you have only that object in the, in the microscope of your attention. And your attention can then see those hidden parts of the, the object that you cannot see any other way. So this is the deepest contemplation no distraction from 
your genetic memory. Okay, this is deflection. This is the next step of deep contemplation. And this is the breathing, uh, which uh, quietens the mind, reduces the random bubbling up of uh, genetic memory into your consciousness. Okay, you practice this deep breathing for 10, 15, 20 minutes a day, and you see how calm your mind gets. You see how attentive you get, and you see how deeply you can think. It will be your subjective experience, but who can see what is happening in your mind better than you can? People can perceive your behavior, what happened once you perceive those things. I can see that. If I'm close to you, I can see your behavior is better. You are looking good. Your health is better. I can see that. But how you feel inside, I cannot see. So when we have an object here and we attend to that object beyond this, the scope of rationality. Scope of rationality stops here. And here, when we have, when we perceive that object in the light of our wisdom, then that is called contemplative learning. And the eye over there to the left is the eye of the uh, the body, and you can say that represents consciousness. So contemplation, the practice of contemplation goes, takes your consciousness inward, okay? Next step, deeper and deeper consciousness. You learn deeper and deeper as you go deeper in your consciousness. Your consciousness approaches the spirit away from the body. Okay. So so this is contemplation. Actually, you can push this line this way with contemplation. You can increase the scope of wisdom. Okay, now this is the, um, I'm trying to explain things in a mathematical term here. Uh, probably, this is not mathematical, the next slide is, you know, we started existing with the beginning 14 and a half billion years ago with the Big Bang. Now, what we know now is the result of our past history. That is where the instincts come from. The experience of life of all of our ancestors. Okay. The first thing when we start here, there is that understanding and knowledge, actually experience of non-duality from the source, everything emerges. The source itself is nothing. So there is no differentiation in the source. Differentiation begins way, um, you know, after billions of years. And then uh, four billion uh, years, four and a half billion years ago, the planet Earth appeared. And then first life form appeared. And that's when the first gene existed. The gene I have now is the child of the gene that existed in the very beginning. 
Okay, I got my genes from my parents, they got from their parents, they got from their parents, they got from their ancestors, they got from their predecessors. Kept on, keep on going way back there. Our genes have the phylogenetic memory of the first life form that existed four billion years ago. And all the other life forms that it gave rise to. Okay. So if I want to understand my nature, it's good to know evolution of life. It's good to know how mind evolved and good to know how brain evolved and so on and so forth. So uh, that is the kind of teaching that I'm talking about when I talk of contemplative learning. Uh, to understand who am I, what am I, what am I capable of? What is my potential? What is limiting me? That kind of understanding is contemplative knowledge, contemplative teaching. And then this is size-wise. Spirit, for example, is infinitely subtle. Okay, dimension of the spirit is zero. The subtlest possible. Okay, and, and then from the spirit or energy comes quantum particles, particles that are way smaller than protons and, 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 and neutrons. And also protons and neutrons are also considered to be quantum particles, but electrons, protons and neutrons, they're all concretized energy. And it is real energy that has to hold them together in atomic uh, integrity for matter to exist. A human being is uh, about two meters uh, and, and then 10 to the power plus n means bigger and bigger and bigger. As you go this way, it becomes bigger. The size becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you go from here, that way, the size becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, 10 to the power negative n, okay? That means 10, one divided by 10 to the power n. This is 10 to the power n straight. And space, uh, heavenly bodies are here. Okay, and um, theory of relativity, general theory of relativity that Einstein came up with, how the heavenly bodies move, how their gravity, gravitational pull works, is totally different from where the gravitational pull works between the apple and the earth. Newtonian, that is Newtonian physics. The theory of relativity that applies to heavenly bodies, totally different from the physics that applies to these bodies that are here, uh, classical physics or Newtonian physics, physics of uh, matter within human experience. And then quantum physics applies to little particles, tiny little particles that cannot be perceived. You need very high powered electrons to perceive that. And then also to energy, which cannot be perceived as the highest power of, uh, um, of uh, a microscope. So this essentially shows contemplative learning. You can, you can, you don't have to do much to learn things of common human experience. It's obvious. And finding out about that, you know, you can find out do some experiments, you will know. Uh, here, not too many experiments can be done. And here, no experiments can be done. So in here, knowledge is first sought contemplatively, and then you may do ex experiments. Here, no experiments can be done. So Einstein discovered theory of relativity with what is called mind experiments. Okay, spiritual tradition 
is comfortable with paradoxes. Universe of 92 billion light years across comes from an infinite, infinitesimal spirit, which cannot be perceived at all. That's a huge paradox. Paradox in science, this material universe coming from energy which cannot be perceived or defined or known or seen is a huge paradox, but that's what uh, you can learn with spiritual tradition. It's comfortable with paradox. Religion is not. Spirituality is, whereas many political movements are not. But all truth is paradoxical. What it is to live in a space of transformative change is to engender greater and greater comfort with paradoxes. Reverend Angel Theodore Williams, W is lower case. Spirit energy, okay, uh, we have talked about it in itself, perceptible, but and, and uh, paradoxes in spirituality and physics in itself, imperceptible, but entire perceptible universe of 92 billion light years cross emerges from spirit or energy, whatever name you give it. In itself, formless, but the entire universe of form emerges from it. In itself, without any attribute, but all attributes emerge from it. Black emerge from it, white emerge from it, green emerge from it. You cannot say this is white or this is green, but or black, but they all come from it. By itself, you cannot say it has any attribute, but all attributes are sourced from it. No definition for it, but all that is definite emerges from it. All that we can say is that the universe emerges from it, sustained in it, and dissolved back into it. But this is not an independent definition. We can say what the effects are. The universe comes out of energy. Energy is what sustains the universe. What do I eat? I eat sunshine. What I food I eat is essential uh, harvesting of solar energy with the help of water and, and, and the earth. Um, and when I die, what happens to the matter? Uh, that was my body. It becomes energy again. It becomes um, manure. You put it in the gardens and, you know, it becomes food again. Uh, it, uh, and dissolved back into uh, it. Now, but this is not an independent definition. Independent definition, what is energy? I cannot say. I can say what energy can do but I cannot say what it is. So current narrow skill-based survival-oriented education, it leads to disregard of our existential truth, everlasting mistrust and conflicts, disregard of common good, stoking over abating instinctive fires, it strokes in instinctive fires, the current education, mere survival over survival in health and harmony, uh, disregard of planetary wellness, we are not worried about planetary wellness, we are only worried about our own self. Identity savagery is the result. That's what I saw when I was 10 years of age, when India got divided into two uh, countries tribalism and bigotry, unhealthy lives of toxic stress and poverty, having more rather than being more. It must change. Education must change its focus to teach our existential truth, which balances survival with health and harmony. Uh, Broad-based education, then I, Quote here a Sanskrit 
uh, verse that talks about education. What is uh, broad based education? Like this is a, an example. Education that teaches us this. Rocks and waters are words of God and uh, so are men are from the spirit. You can say, uh, God, if you are allergic to this word as I am, um, God was never my friend. God being the source of so much cruelty of humanity against each other. So I became anti-God right when I was 10 years of age. Uh, and I make no bones about it. That's my history. That's my life. So what does this mean? Facilitation to the teacher who shows us how to experience that, that is a pointer to the spirit, that which manifests in the indivisible universe of the animate and the inanimate. That which manifests as the animate and the inanimate. What that is, we don't know. But a teacher, a good teacher, my salutes to those, that kind of teacher who can give me the experience, contemplative experience of that. Okay, now once we have that experience, what happens to us? Our genes, genetic disposition change, now become unifying. Neural circuits become unifying. A brain is supposed to be Plastic, it can mold itself with good thoughts and good learning and good experiences. It can mold itself. And that's what happens. Uh, physical health, the strong immune system will result uh, because uh, there is no fear. If we see everything as uh, coming from the same source, uh, fear disappears. Uh, understanding is replaced by fear. You overcome fear, strong health and, uh, and healthy mind. Fear is what leads to stress. And stress, as I told you, was the cause of uh, majority of the diseases. Profound learning capability, executive control. We, we gave in the, the exact, executive control of our body. Uh, we are the chief executive officer of the enterprise of our life. That is what happens sense of belonging, uh, we belong to the whole world. So we serve the world as a result when we have a sense of belonging. Affluence with emotional intelligence results. If we can perceive what Einstein could perceive, we will never starve, we'll always be affluent. We don't have to try to make money, money will be attracted to us. Common environmental good will happen. Treatment of with love and compassion will treat others. Holistic and uh, non-violence behavior, academic success and discipline, unifying and equ equanimous. Uh, we will become responsible consumption. We will not exploit nature. We'll use nature and that use will be responsible respectful of nature and mind will be calm with clarity, stability and exuberance in life. We'll be full of energy, but we will not be running around mindlessly. We will have a stable body and a stable mind, not an unstable or uh, equilibrium. Uh, Self-cultivation and regulation, we can regulate our behavior because we can, we cultivate the self to get there. And we become one, not the other. We are all one, oneness is ours, and the world becomes harmonious and peaceful. Uh, so those would be the results. And then say, where is, what, is there any example of contemplative learning anywhere else? There are two such examples. In current history, 
five Nordic countries of modern Europe. They, uh, in the end of 17th, uh, 18th century, they instituted in those five countries what is called, in Germany is called Bildung education. That Bildung education is general education, essentially to cultivate the mind and the uh, uh, survival oriented education is given a second priority. First thing is we all learn how to cultivate the mind and second priority is how to make money to survive. This is current history right now. Um, and as a result of um, 200 years um, of uh, uh, education that cultivates the mind, uh, they are the happiest countries. 10 years ago, the United Nations started to make a survey of the whole, all nations of the world, member countries of the world. And these five Nordic countries are among, have been amongst the top 10 every year for the last 10 years. It's only 10 years ago that they started doing the survey. In the last 10 years, they are fairly rich, not the richest, but, but not poor, uh, fairly rich and very well behaved, everything running smoothly, people living in harmony and health. That is a current example and Indigenous India, up to 1700, uh, India was the leaders, leading economy of the world. And also its contribution to mathematics, astronomy, uh, surgery, uh, uh, medicine, all kinds of contributions you can find in the ancient India. It's only the recent history of India has not been good. We became enslaved by uh, or became colonies of uh, foreign cultures which had uh, no understanding of the Indian culture, uh, no understanding of the cultivation of mind at all. And as a result, um, they imposed education, um, which is no different from the education uh, in other countries. So, as a result, we've gone down. Uh, but if you look at ancient India, look at the contributions of it in science and technology and in mathematics and in astronomy and whatever else, uh, and in industry, uh, India was rich because of uh, textile industry, because of agriculture. They must, there were so many. Um, uh, actually, charcoal filter of water, water filtration was invented in India. Flush toilet was invented in India. Now, it's a different story. So, that is the end of my presentation. And uh, uh, I've almost taken an hour and 15 minutes. And <laughs> please correspond with me i want to uh, i want to put the the uh, the link for you to download the uh, handout uh, i'll put that in the chat can you please copy it and take it with you or maybe you can you're sitting on your computer you might as well click on it now and you will see a pdf open up and you can save it on your computer and read it. Mm. Uh, okay. Uh, chat. There is a chat. Um.
I got the link for the handout that is uh, maybe you can click on this link and you can uh, the uh, PDF will open on your computer and then you can save that PDF on your computer and and correspond with me on it. Uh, I'll appreciate receiving your uh, opinions and your suggestions for improving this proposal. Uh, I'm only sending you the uh, uh, maybe 20, 30 pages uh, of a book size page. Uh, and all the background material is in appendices and the total number of pages is about 300. So I didn't send you the whole 300 pages. Uh, manuscript is already written and Bob, my friend is uh, editing it before publication. So any question, uh, any uh, discussion, please feel free to ask, unmute yourself and, and uh, let's uh, interact with each other. Yeah. Yeah. May I? I'm John here. Hey, thank you for a beautiful uh, presentation. I've been following along in your book. Oh. I, I followed along. I've been following along in your book today where I could find. Uh, and it's like, this is a beautiful book. I, I am so thankful for all your lifelong heartfelt uh, wisdom that went into this book and uh, I'm uh, very well uh, uh, just I feel your heart I feel your energy and I'm thank you. grateful for your work thank you very much thank you so very much John I see uh, Vlad is going to present. Vlad Blarka uh, is here. Vlad, maybe you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, let me introduce you. And maybe you can open your camera. Hello? Hi, Chef. Uh, this, this is Vlad Larka, and Vlad has been helping me do some research that went into the book, and uh, has also gone into the uh, the proposal I made, and uh, he spent uh, four years, uh, four summers working for me. Yeah, four summers. And this is the fifth summer going, right, Vlad? And now Vlad has uh, uh, graduated. Uh, from University of Waterloo, and uh, I'm a science person, but a researcher in spirituality, and I have been hiring students from the University of Waterloo. Only one year I hired a student that was not from science. Uh, mm -hmm. I find uh, people who are used to critical thinking uh, are uh, more uh, comfortable with the wisdom uh, that is there in the scriptures and also wisdom of science. And they, uh, they are much more logical uh, in their research. So, uh, once I hired a person from the Faculty of Religion, and she did a good job too, but that she was a graduate student, a mature graduate student. But yeah. other than that, I've had uh, students from health, uh, from uh, health sciences, essentially, uh, biology, 
uh, th that kind of science, neurology, uh, neuropsychology, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, they've done some tremendous work for me and Vlad has uh, done some tremendous work for me and uh, he's going to present on um, he's going to present on Vlad, what is your topic? Uh, I'm going to be talking how we can regulate our physiology sorry, regulate our behavior through our physiology okay so um, can you hear me well? Just wondering. You can hear me? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we okay. can hear you. Uh, I'm going to stop my recording and start your recording later on. Okay. How do you, how do you stop? Um, Shiv, I can, Siv, I can uh, just make him a co-host and he can record. Okay, so you can you want. please? Uh, uh, Vlad, can you record um, on your computer? Yeah, I just, uh, once I'm co-host, I just. Yeah, okay. one second, record. let me make him co a co-host. Uh, Richard, how do you stop live streaming? Uh, you just hit the button down. It's in the corner, the far right button. Far right button. Oh, you'll have to make him a co-host, yeah. Seb. Okay. Chief, I can't do it. I don't have permission to do it. Okay. Uh, I can't see. Can you can't seem to find it. View stream on Facebook. Copy stream link. Uh, I don't know how to do it. I can't. I started it. Oh, I started. Are from you there. trying to make somebody else a host? I, I, I got it. I got it. I think I got it. It's um, uh, it's on the other computer. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I was. I had the two zooms going at the same time, uh, and I forgot which zoom I was using. Uh, stop live streaming. Okay. I have stopped live streaming now. Okay. Um, Vlad, you do the recording and when you're ready, I will live stream you um, to Facebook. Um, okay. I think you uh, still need to stop your recording first and uh, then I'll be able to uh, do it afterwards. I, 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 I have to stop my recording. Unless it, yeah. Uh, uh, Otherwise it would just I, be one I file. It is, uh, it is already stopped. Okay. It, you, you can yeah. start your recording whenever you're ready and uh, okay. ask me to, we still have five minutes to five. Maybe yeah. some people are still coming. Uh, okay. So we'll, we can wait. And uh, I think I still, I'm not sure if I'm a co-host yet, quite yet. Uh, then let me see. I can check whether you are a co-host or not. You're not, you're not a co-host yet, Bill. Okay. Yeah. Richard, yeah. But so, Shiv, yeah. you'll have to do it. I don't have permission to do it. Oh, I'll have to do it. Okay, just give me a co-host. Can I make a co-host? Maybe a usually you can, but I don't know why it doesn't permit you to do it. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. No, nope, um, I can't do it. Worry about it. Why? No, later. Vlad, um, you are way at the end. Can I make a suggestion of something you might not be doing to change a person to a host? Uh, I just learned this yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, you you go to the participants. You go okay. to the person's name that mm -hmm. you want to make the host and. Okay. When you click on that, you'll see the more. Click on yeah, their word yeah. more, and that's where host pops up, where okay. you can click on host. Okay. Yep, that's what I've been doing. That I don't have access, Shiv. Just give me one minute. Let me see if I can. Um, Participants. Spotlight, 
uh, recording permission for the waiting list removed. Who, who is it that you're wanting to make host? Uh, uh, I get uh, Richard. Can I yep. make you host, and then you can? Sure. Uh, make me host. Okay. There you go. But before I make you host, I better start. Uh, I better start live streaming. Um, as soon as I make you host, I will have no live streaming uh, permission. Right. Uh, You're giving an incredible okay. talk. Uh, I'm going to you know, be happy Another way out. is to... Another way is to... Uh, you are a co-host right now. Uh, can I change that? And yeah, you can make me host. Uh, come on. Just click on my name and then go over to where the camera is in the far right. Oh. That, that wouldn't I, be on your other I computer see, access. I, it? I don't see the... Okay, maybe I think the two computers are giving me a problem. Uh, oh, yeah, because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you have two accounts or yeah, two. Yeah. Make you have one, you're a co host uh, and the co host. You are a co host now. You, okay, you yeah. Have, you see yourself as co, as co host. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're good, Val. All right, thank you. Now you can record, and I will begin the live streaming. You tell me when. Uh, it's five o'clock, anyway. So. Okay, let me just share my screen, and it should be good. Okay, I'm going to start the live streaming. Just a second. Now you're being streamed to live uh, to Facebook. <laughs> okay. All right. Whenever you are ready, you can begin. So you can see my screen now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Vlad Blarka. I have been working with uh, Shiv and with Shen for, as you mentioned, four summers now. Um, we've been, you know, I've been helping him throughout this whole process with all the research and I've really gotten a better understanding of everything that the organization and Shiv is trying to um, show and share. There's a lot of valuable information there that I, uh, I found really incredible. And over the, the last four years, I've just come to appreciate it a lot. Um, and it's been, it's been very helpful in my life as well. And today I will be talking about basically an accumulation of everything we've been researching, um, how we can shift from our norm, normal state, um, which is governed by our instincts and our impulses um, and how we can, shift from that to being more conscious and having more control in our lives. And this will help us become more harmonious with ourselves and with other people. Uh, other people. Um, and if you have any questions, you can just add it to the chat. I, I don't know if I will be able to look at it um, during the presentation, but afterwards I'm happy to talk about anything or uh, answer any questions that anyone may have. So just leave it in the chat and then um, I'll get to that afterwards. So um, what is the issue that is, is causing us to not, you know, have full control over our lives? Um, Shiv was talking about this in his previous presentation as well, but I'm just going to go into more detail. Um, it is basically our inbuilt natural instincts and impulses. These things uh, govern our lives and 
impact all the decisions and actions we take without us even knowing for the most part. Um, these are things that we are born with and we don't really get a choice in, in deciding on um, these things. So um, these four things that, that the main four instincts that I'll be discussing are survival, sustenance, procreation and ego identity. So basically um, in, in evolutionary terms, those species that survive are then able to pass on their genes. Um, so that is one of the main driving impulses, um, staying alive and passing the genes. Um, and then in addition to that, there is the sustenance, which is you know getting enough resources, resources so that we are able to survive and so that we are able to pass on our genes to the next generation. Um, and then procreation, uh, it speaks for itself. We need to, you know, procreate um, to pass on those genes as well. And then we also have the ego identity, which is um, something that keeps us safe or evolutionarily kept us safe, but in our present time is kind of keeping us divided. Um, so that would refer to the herd identity. We like to identify with those that are similar to us. Uh, may that be religion, culture, um, you know, how we dress, how we look, things like that. And, and these things are basically keeping us uh, separated um, because we are identifying with, with things that are similar to us and then seeing the other um, things that are not uh, similar to us as uh, something separate from us. And without intervention, these four things are kind of making, um, paving the road for the decisions and actions we make, as I, as I mentioned. And this sort of mindset is keeping our autonomic uh, demands high. Um, and when our autonomic demands are high, we aren't really in full control of ourselves. And these instincts are passed down evolutionarily, as I mentioned, from our predecessors over billions of years. And on the right is a diagram um, that Shiv created um, that kind of you know, summarizes what is happening. We have high sympathetic drive because of this autonomic, our high autonomic demands that are formed because of our inbuilt natural instincts, which leads to high limbic activation, high sympathetic activation, um, leading to high cortisol levels, um, altered neural network, and then our altered epigenetic memory. So I will be breaking all of these steps down further and uh, going into more detail. So phylogenetics is important for con uh, context. Um, this describes you know, evolutionary relationships and how all life forms are um, connected by ancestry and descent. And this goes as far as Darwin. He was um, also looking at uh, phylogenetics and Basically, it helps us see what is common between species and what is also different between species. And as I mentioned, the most basic instincts are shared between the most um, complex species and even the very lower uh, species. Um, and one of the things that phylogenetics shows us is how our physiology and endocrine endocrine system reacts to certain things. Um, the way our body reacts to certain stimulus or external factors, um, a lot of the times is kind of predetermined by our evolution. So whenever something happens to us, our body will automatically respond without us even getting a say in how, how things happen. And if we're not aware of these things, then we're just being dragged around by these things uh, without a say in that. So, Knowing the context of, of the history is important, but how, what does this mean exactly physiologically and how is this reflected within our body? Um, I will be talking about this next. So this is the autonomic nervous system. Um, the autonom autonomic nervous system is the system that is responsible for unconscious activities in our body. Um, so the sympath sympathetic, um, part of the autonomic nervous system um, is responsible for the fight or flight response, which is the most extreme um, reaction of the sympathetic system. So, you know, if we're in a dangerous situation, 
we're faced with danger, we want to either, you know, take that situation head on or run away. So our body prepares for these situations. Um, and as you can see in this diagram, some things that happen during the fight or flight or during sympathetic activation, um, our pupils dilate, our, um, there are mucus and enzymes secreted. We have increased heart rate so that more blood is pumped in that, and so that you know, we are ready for action and we are ready to either escape or take it head on, as I mentioned. Um, also, our digestion is inhibited because there's no need to digest our food when we're in immediate danger. That is the last sort of thing that we need to focus on. Um, and we also have other things um, like, um, sorry, um, increased heart rate, as I mentioned, increased blood flow to different parts of our body. And then on the other hand, we have the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest. So when we're not in, you know, danger or we're not in a, in a stressful situation, our body is more relaxed. We have a slower heart rate. Um, we have increases motility and secretion in the stomach. Uh, different enzymes are being released to kind of reflect these changes. And in most cases, these two, um, these two parts of the autonomic nervous system are in balance. And when they're in balance, uh, that is sort of the normal state. However, when we're not actually in danger and we are not actually in, in real physical danger, our body can still perceive it that we are in danger. And this is based on our instincts that I was talking about previously. Um, although there is not like immediate danger, something like a dangerous animal in front of us, our body still is in that mind state. You know, we, when we're stressed or when we're anxious, we can notice that our body is responding and acting a different way. We are breathing um, how we breathe normally. We, we feel, I guess, the tightening in our chest our thoughts may be racing and we don't have control. So, you know, when we're in this state where things are going out of control, we, we don't make the right decisions a lot of the time. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, this can vary in intensity for people. Some people may be in sympathetic dominance, which is where your sympathetic system is active more um, for a larger period of time or it may come and go. It depends on the person and the experiences that we have, we have had throughout our lives. So once again, these are some of the effects of sympathetic activation, um, which I already mentioned. Some things that I didn't talk about were the high blood glucose uh, for increased cellular metabolism, high heart rate, increased cortisol in the blood, high breath frequency resulting in shallow chest breathing. Um, and that's one of the importance, which I'll discuss, of deep breathing and conscious deep breathing. There is also increased blood flow to skeletal, uh, skeletal tissues for increased physical activity. Um, and there are higher energy demands combined with low oxygen supply, um, which leads to high lactic acid for fermentation. So when this is happening, when we are in high sympathetic activity, we have high mental activity focused on instinctive demand um, at the cost of typically unselfish spirituality. And we have mindless physical activity. So we are always trying to chase things or trying to, uh, to get these things that are backed by our impulses. Like I mentioned, survival, procreation, sustenance. We are sort of being governed by these without getting a say or without second, um, without questioning uh, these things that are kind of driving us on our day-to-day -day life. And the issue is not with this response in itself because evolutionarily it is a needed response. However, when this is our, um, when this is happening frequently and this is our go-to state, then this is where the problems arise. The damaging effects come from chronic sympathetic activation which leads to sympathetic dominance where the majority of time we will be experiencing these, these effects that are on the screen. Um, and it is much harder for us to kind of tone that down to the base level where we are more relaxed. So what happens over being in sympathetic dominance over long periods of time 
a lot of negative impacts can start to arise. And as I mentioned, this is not going to be the same for everyone. Everyone's going to experience this differently, but a lot of things can be explained by this. So some of the things like mental disease, physical disease, uh, disconnect from thinking, learning disabilities. If we're always, if our mind is always racing and we're not able to control that, it's going to be hard for us to learn and to really put our mind to focus so that we can you know, learn things that we want to or do the things that we want to. There's also, this can lead to selfish and divisive behavior because we want to basically get these, these impulses. We want to uh, satisfy these impulses and instincts. And if we don't and, and other people get in our way, then we will perceive them as a threat or something that is stopping us. Um, and this is what will lead to reactive behavior without us thinking and, and deciding why am I reacting this way? Why am I doing this? And this can also be, you know, something that can lead to more criminal tendency or bigotry and racism from our subconscious because we're separating ourselves from individuals who are different and we're seeing them as, some, uh, as getting in the way of us fulfilling our desires and our impulses. And this figure right here just kind of backs up what I was saying. Um, if we're in full danger, then our sympathetic uh, activation will be all the way high. And if, if we're relaxed, we will, we will have that lower. So it is the balance of this that we are trying to take control over so that we are not just being driven by it. And um, these things right here don't just happen, you know, overnight all of these things take time to develop and as as uh we start as young children we have you know we are taught by our parents a lot of the techniques and coping skills we have um and those things never really change unless we take a second look at at these things so this will drive us and push us into a direction that we may not want to or we may not know why it is taking us there so the the responses that I, I was talking about were the uh, nervous system responses. Um, and this is an immediate response, which is why when we're in a fight or flight situation, all of these responses will be felt immediately. But in addition to that, we also have the endocrine system, which revolves around hormones. And these hormones are lower acting. So they take longer to, to accumulate and to happen. So one of these main ones is cortisol, which is released from the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys. Um, and the stress response follows after the release of cortisol. So although this is a normal, spark, uh, normal response, it can go out of control, just like the uh, nervous system response can go out of control. And one of the effects of chronic stress is the suppression of the immune system. So this is just one example of a physiological response of, you know, sustained uh, cortisol release and sustained stress within our body. And it, the thing that, that really is important to understand is that all of these responses are inter interconnected. The endocrine system and the autonomic response part of the nervous system are all connected. So if something happens, it will impact another system in our body. And uh, in what I'm trying to say is it's all connected. And it, they'll all impact each other. So they will reinforce the response. And not only will it have a physical response within our body that we can notice, it will also have a behavioral response. So how we act and how we behave and how and the actions we take are, are impacted by our physiology and, and what is happening within our body. And that is where we have the ability to take control. Um, by taking control of our physiology, this will change our behavior and this will change how we act and how we interact with people around us. So the next topic that I wanted to talk about is the brain plasticity. Um, it may be a topic that you are familiar with or may not be, but 
what brain plasticity uh, refers to is the brain's ability to adapt uh, and change based on experience. So not only will our instincts affect us in the present moment, um, but it will also, each response that happens will impact us later in life. And, and it will also impact the responses that happen to our body later um, based on different factors. So what happens every time there is a response in our body, that signal is reinforced. So right here, there is an image uh, that shows a negative feedback loop. So what happens normal normally is there is a stimulus, then there is a response. And then because of that response, there will be um, uh, a response to counteract the stimulus. And then the response loop shuts off. So say we are stressed then our body releases the stress hormone, and then our body realizes that we have elevated stress. So our body will stop releasing that stress hormone. However, if, if this turns into a positive feedback, then you know if we are stressed, then our body will be used to this. Our body will understand that we're stressed often. So it will kind of adapt to that and it will stay in the stressed, um, stressed atmosphere environment where you know any little amount of of stress or any trigger that is similar to that will also activate this response and this kind of builds on itself the more our body behaves a certain way the more likely it is that it will see this state as the new normal so it will change from an existing you know state to this new state and it will maintain that state and one one very um interesting thing that I read was that the nervous system is never structurally structurally or functionally identical throughout life. So we may not think that being stressed every once in a while or you know being anxious is going to have that big an impact, but our body stores this information and will then use this information to make decisions later on whenever we experience something new. So basically, the sooner we learn to control our physiology and our impulses, the more control we have in our lives because we are changing that circuit and we are changing how things are happening. And not only um, will, this, will this affect our body, but it will affect you know, the formation of new neurons um, and how the connections are, are forming in the brain. Um, the interaction between the brain and, and the connections is constantly changing based on the endocrine activity in the body. So all the stress hormones and all the other hormones that are being um, impacted by the release of the stress hormone cortisol. Um, and under chronic stress conditions, our brain may be unable to properly regulate and terminate the stress bond. So it goes into this permanent new equilibrium. And as I mentioned, the sooner this starts, the more of an impact it will have because these hormones uh, leave an imprint, as I mentioned. So the earlier it starts, if you are experiencing stress and um, certain types of environmental factors that are ne negative, negatively impacting you as a child, your body will store this and then it will act in the same way as you get older and it'll also you know, sort of build on itself and continue and continue and continue um, until it is our go-to state. So brain plasticity refers to the immediate changes of our brain, but this goes even further. Um, and I will be talking about how that alters epigenetic memory. But this diagram right here shows how we start with, on the left side, we have a, um, a neuronal connection, and then there will be growth, uh, uh, branching growth. So it'll split out into many different directions and form many different connections. Um, and then as we get older, basically these connections shrink and, and solidify the ones that are used more often. What this diagram is showing that mental diseases and stress hormones and injury and stuff like that, basically get rid of certain pathways in our brain and reinforce those ones that already exist so then it is hard for us to escape that um, and once again now we can look at this diagram 
and see how all of this connects. If we have high sympathetic drive based on our impulses, then we have high limbic activation. That leads to high sympathetic activation and high cortisol. And then that alters our neural network. And once our neural network is altered, this can lead to epigenetic changes and altered epigenetic memory. So what epigenetics refers to is the fact that not only can our, um, our sympathetic dominance that we experience affect us in this lifetime, it can be detrimental to future generations. So what happens is we can activate certain genes or pathways in our body due to our physiology and this will be stored or this will cause little changes in our, in our DNA and our chemistry that will basically express new genes. And what this means is that these things will then be passed on to our offspring. If we decide to you know, have kids, um, our kids will also have this new altered state. Um, and this right here just explains how different environmental chemicals or mental diseases can cause these changes in our genetics that will be passed on to our, our future generations. So the, the more this effect is sustained, the longer and more impact it will have in the future. And the more unconscious it goes, things like this in our genetics are things that are out of our control. We don't decide that you know, we want to activate these pathways or pass it on so that you know, our children uh, experience this, but it happens without us, us realizing. And that's the importance of, of learning about this because if we learn what is actually happening, then we can learn how to combat this and how we can reverse this and how we can use our effort and, and conscious the control to reverse this. So what we can do is we can consciously decrease our breathing frequency. And this is what uh, Shiv has been studying for many years um, and is the focus of, of his work, how we can decrease our breathing frequency to reduce the sympathetic dominance um, and then reduce the ability of sympathetic dominance and our impulses to control our decisions and actions. Um, and by doing this, we are going right at the source we cannot control our genes. We cannot control how our brain is wired um, from the start, but we can control how it will change going forward. So by doing conscious deep breathing, um, we are lowering our sympathetic drive, which leads to low limbic activation, low sympathetic activation and lower cortisol, which I mentioned will cause the stress response and then um, alter our, you know, our neural network. And if we have lower cortisol, then we won't be reinforcing these pathways that are, are causing us to behave in a certain way. And this will also alter our genetic, epigenetic memory. If we don't um, active, activate these certain pathways, then there may be a chance that we don't pass it on. So we have the choice to break this cycle. And the earlier we start, the less we struggle. And this is not something that is easily done. This requires a breathing practice um, that is maintained daily, um, that constantly builds on itself. If we just do nothing and take no action, it will continue to go in the opposite direction, which is towards sympathetic dominance. However, if we are consistently doing a deep breathing practice that lowers our sympathetic drive over time, the positive effects will accumulate and accumulate. And this will have um, more positive impacts the more we do it. Because the more we reinforce something in a negative way, as I mentioned, we can also do that in a positive way. The more we reinforce these positive neural networks, the more that will become the norm and that will become how our body expects things to be. So, Daily practice is what is key here. Um, and this will have the long lasting changes that, that are needed to break out, of, um, break out of the control of our impulses. 
And one thing that is important to know is that the breast is usually under autonomic control if we're not aware. However, we have the ability to control it with our own um, consciousness. So we can choose to alter our breath frequency. We can choose to focus on our breath. These are all things that are under all that are under our control. And one thing that is important is that all of this is proven and shown by science to have positive impacts. There have been many studies that have looked at how a conscious breathing practice can reduce our sympathetic drive and how it can do and help us make all these changes that I'm referring to. Uh, one study in particular showed that volitional breathing, which is conscious breathing, um, changed the connectivity between different parts of the brain 